and welcome back. We are talking about section 5.2, integration by substitution. We're going to tackle this second learning objective, solve initial value problems using substitution. We're going to do this in particular with a word problem, because everybody loves word problems. And here it is, lots of words. Vanessa is a public employee who has an annuity, so she's got this 403B. She puts in money, and so there's some, some nuance here, but continuously is implying that basically there's just constantly money being slowly trickling from her account into this 403B at the rate of, basically, by the end of each year, $40,000 hits. Stroke of midnight, happy new year, confetti, and 40, she hits the $40,000 mark, then $80,000 by the next year. So uh, it earns 2.6% annual interest. Our job is to, one, write a differential equation modeling this growth rate. So remember, differential equation is going to mean an equation that's got a derivative or differential stuff in it. We're supposed to solve that differential equation and then lastly determine how much it's worth at the end of 10 years. Okay, so first step, build our equation. So let's see if we can translate the stuff that they've given us. So the 403B grows in two different ways. One, uh, so there's our growth rate. One is that she puts money in. So there's 40, and uh, we'll treat this in thousands, and I'll make this explicit in just a sec. And not only does money uh, get dumped in by her, but then it also gets added on to. And it's really important that we match the variables here appropriately. So this is not, uh, two, so two, there's the 2.6%. It's not 2.6% of T. It's not saying 2% of whatever year I'm at, 2015, 2020, whatever it may be. It's 2% of the current amount of this. So we get this very interesting scenario where the rate of change in the amount depends on the amount that's in there, which is exactly what compound interest is supposed to do. So here's, here's the making everything formal. So A is the annuity's value, how much is in this account, in thousands of dollars, just so we don't have to write the extra zeros here, and it's T years after she begins this, this account. So mission one is accomplished. We actually have a differential equation now. Okay, so we'll take that differential equation. Our task is to solve this, and this is a little iffy because uh, you might notice if we just brought this dt over, it wouldn't quite satisfy this whole deal because we'd have stuff with a's in it dt. And yeah, when you don't have the variables that match up, then there's trouble. We, we can't efficiently perform this integration. So uh, if you recall, the strategy called separation of variables, uh, basically the deal is we're going to try to get all the A stuff together and all the T stuff together on different sides of the equation. So we do bring the DT over, just like up above here, but then we're going to take this whole expression and we're going to divide it over. So it actually ends up in the denominator with this DA on the left. So there's a little subtlety here, and it's worth taking a moment to mention. We shouldn't be subtracting stuff from either side. Because if you notice, I did decide to put these parentheses here, and I'm sort of glad I did, because it's basically, if you imagine, like multiplication, where we would have to have 40 dt plus 40, I'm sorry, plus 0.026a dt if we wanted to kind of distribute this right side. So moving stuff over to the left side is going to pull a dt with it no matter what we do. And we were just saying, look, we don't want a's and t's on the same sides. We want to, we want to sort of separate these, these folks, put them on different sides so that we can integrate this effectively. So really, the only strategy that's going to do that without messing up our terms is to divide by this entire thing in parentheses here. Divide out this entire expression over to the left side. Now a's are on the left. And, you know, sure, admittedly, the right side is not super exciting, but it does have the dt stuff away from the a's. So we have kind of effectively separated. And then our separation of uh, variables strategy basically says, okay, fine, if these two things were already equal, then their families of antiderivatives should be equal as well. I mean, that's, that's a subtlety, but, but it's a reasonable one, a uh, reasonable assumption to make. And then, so here's the excitement. This left side is not exactly like our power rule situation. So we actually do need to take some additional steps. And surprise, surprise, the section on substitution requires a substitution. So uh, the piece that we'll go with, uh, maybe I'll back up for just a moment. So this whole expression, the trouble spot is basically that this denominator looks kind of too complicated. It doesn't look like uh, just something to a power. So we can take uh, our substitution to basically be that left side denominator. 
then the derivative of all this stuff would end up being, well, derivative of 40 is going to be 0. And then the derivative of this, because it's with respect to a, is just that constant. Think of a like the x, essentially. So 0.02x, its derivative is just 0.026. Okay, and then we'll see how this uh, pans out. We, we, again, I'll just reiterate that my strategy is typically to isolate the differential term that was already in the integral. We had a dA before. We're trying to get rid of all of our a's, replace them with something that's more convenient. So I try to solve for dA, which means that this expression, uh, the 0.026, is going to get divided over. And so now what we've got, I got a little overzealous there. Um, now what we've got is this 0.026 on the bottom, dA is isolated. Okay, so our integral now looks like, so this is just a reiteration of where we were, now this entire denominator becomes just u. So let's see if we can do some color imitation here. So there's the old and in with the new. So that's the substitution we made. And then uh, you, we can also notice, I guess I could have kept the red there for a sec. Um, here's dA, there's where our differential term used to be, and all of this is what's replacing it. But it is still mission accomplished. We, we did get the, the inside of this integral to have entirely our substituted variable, just u. So there's no more a's represented in here. And this was just to try to make things a little bit easier on us. And here we've got a constant. This is a weird looking fraction, but a fraction nevertheless. We can pull it out. And all we really have to do is integral of 1 over u. And you might recall, this isn't actually power rule that can tackle this for us. This is one of those special cases. So integral of 1 over u is natural log of, technically, absolute value of u. We'll, we'll try to continue to be careful about this, because it can make a difference. So integral of 1 over u is natural log of the positive version of u. It comes along with its own uh, in, constant of integration. And I've sort of been ignoring the right side, but it's worth paying attention to. This, this is really just integral of 1 dt. So integral of dt is just integral of the constant 1. So this is going to end up going up by 1. So if we had 1 times x to the 0, kind of the most boring thing we could get, then the new, the antiderivative of that is going to be <laughs> power goes up by 1, which is 0 up to 1, divide by 1, but yeah, right, all we're going to end up with is x. In this case, it's actually t. So this, this is important to note what the differential term is, because it's reminding us that our variable here is actually going to be t. Okay, so uh, it comes along with its own constant of integration. These don't have to be the same, so I'm sort of hedging bets and just calling them two different things, subscript one, subscript two. But really, what we're going to end up doing is just always combining these two things. Because if you have an arbitrary constant minus some other constant that can be whatever it wants, you really still just have one constant. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to reiterate that, that last line that we had there and start trying to pull stuff together. So this is us, yes, you and I together, subtracting C2 over. That's going to get us a part of this new constant. And then the last thing is uh, multiplying by 0.026. So we're going to get that extra constant. And just to reiterate, basically, multiplying by 0.026 after we subtract these two things, that's what we're going to call this new constant of integration. So this, this gets a little funny. I mean, you can always just hang on to these. There's no reason you have to call this some new letter here. But uh, just for the sake of, of tidiness in this expression, I'm, I'm picking some new constant. OK, so this is the point where we're supposed to back substitute. That is to rewrite this in terms of the original uh, variable. So u is actually all of this stuff with a in it. And this is great. Uh, you might notice one change. And, and I, won't, I won't spoil it here for just a sec, although I tried to. Um, absolute value and not absolute value. So the deal here basically is that we had to be careful about u, um, but in fact we should not be worried about this being a negative number. The only way that this could be negative is if there was a huge negative number in the, the, the actual annuity. And since we're dealing with a word problem here, we can actually think about the interpretation of these variables. And uh, A should not be a large negative number. She might be in debt, but it's not going to be housed in this annuity. Anyway, we don't have to get into that. Um, <laughs> so A is going to be a positive number, which means that this whole deal is going to be positive, too. So absolute values are unnecessary. 
So then next, we haven't really finished getting an, an actual expression for a. We don't really have an a equals kind of situation. So let's let's work the algebra on that real quick just to make that happen. So we're going to take uh, e to both sides to, to cancel out this natural log. We'll take away 40 from everybody, and we'll divide out this 0.026, stick it in the bottom. So this is what we would call a general solution, but this isn't usually good enough until we find an actual value for c. So if we look back at the original statement of this problem, we don't get a whole lot of helpful information, but if we make a convenient assumption that the annuity is empty, that is, there's no money in this thing when she starts investing, that's a pretty reasonable assumption here because time is measured after she starts depositing, then we can use that. We can say, okay, when t equals zero, then a should also be zero, and we can use that to solve for c. Um, one little subtlety, I'll go back here for just a second, there's nothing wrong at all with using this expression to solve for c. If we're being kind of clever, though, there's actually be a better spot to go back to. Um, in particular, if we go back to an earlier version of this equation where we still had natural logs, this is a, a, a great place to begin because if we plug in A and T, C is going to be really easy to solve for. It's just going to fall right into our laps. So at T equals zero, we have no money in the account, so A equals zero. Take a look at our expression or equation with those two values of zero plugged in. Almost everything goes away. On the left side, we've got natural log of 40 because all that's gone. And on the right side, we've got uh, just C. So those two chunks go away. Worst cancellation slashes ever. Great job, Mike. All right, so there's our constant, which is great. We can go back to our equation for A, and uh, here's where that substitution occurred. So we found the concrete value for C. There it goes up top, and mission accomplished. So now we have an expression there. And, uh, oh yeah, if you're feeling clever with the algebra, you can tidy this up so you get a constant of 40 out in front of the E expression. Now, that felt like plenty, and it was. The hard part is over, though. It's the entire problem is not quite done because they also did ask us to figure out how much is in this annuity after 10 years have gone by. So this is, this is sort of anticlimactic, though. We're, we're coming down the hard part of this. So T was in years, so we could dump in 10 years for our value of T evaluate this expression, it gets something on the order of $456,000. That's a good chunk of money, but remember, 10 years of investing, $40,000 per year, so $400,000 of this was Vanessa's own money. So if she didn't invest at all, she'd have $400,000 sitting in her, you know, you know, uh, whatever, her jar in the backyard. But um, because she invested it at, the, at that 2.6% interest, now she's going to get an extra, you know, almost 57 grand out of it. So that's the value of putting the money in the bank in this particular case. Okay, so that's it for substitution.